Good evening and welcome to another edition of A Political Scope. His Excellency President Donald Ramutar on November 10th prorogued the 10th Parliament. At the time, His Excellency would have said that the intention then was to, one, allow for cooling of the heads among uh, politicians, but most importantly was to allow for there to be dialogue among the parliamentary political party, uh, parties on the way forward um, in dealing with a number of matters. The Tenth Parliament, of course, had a number of critical pieces of legislation, inclusive of the Telecommunications uh, Bill, the Education Bill, and a few others. On November 19th, I think, His, His Excellency again wrote to the opposition leader officially, inviting him to sit and talk about the way forward of the Tenth Parliament and, of course, to examine those matters before the House. A few days ago, the opposition leader responded to His Excellency's letter by saying that he will not talk unless the Parliament resume. I have with me in studio this evening the Honorable Priya Manik Chand, Minister of Education and Member of Parliament of the People's Progressive Party Civic, and the Honorable Robson Ben, Minister of Public Works and, of course, a Member of Parliament as well. Welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having us, Eddie. Yeah. November 10th, His Excellency prorogued. Um, if you were to look at how things would have progressed between then and now, your, your thoughts? Well, let's back up a little bit and see why, why uh, the uh, talk a little bit about why the President had decided to prorogue the National Assembly, well, the Parliament. Um, you would recall that we were in a recess, and then in coming out of the recess, there was a very heavy indication, credible indication from the opposition political parties that they were going to, on the first occasion, shut the parliament down, kill it dead, and uh, um, by so doing, remove from us the opportunity to deal with a lot of important issues that were presently live and current in the National Assembly at the time. The president, as the statesman that he is, and as the mature politician, Guyana's daddy, um, thought that that would be dangerous, that would be counterproductive to what we were all saying that we were uh, going to do in the National Assembly, to what we had all sworn to do, that is to serve the people of this country um, without fear or favor to the best of our ability. Um, we would not be able to do that if we were going to kill this parliament and, and remove from us the opportunity to address the issues that were before the parliament. And so he had uh, a couple of options, things that he could have done, dissolve, prorogue, um, go into the parliament and address the no-confidence motion, etc. And so uh, he took a decision that um, he was going to provide a space in the National Assembly for the parliamentary political parties who represent larger Guyana to discuss issues, to dialogue, to do what politicians do best, compromise, negotiate, find a way forward, navigate through this new thing that Guyana had experienced, uh, government in office but not but, uh, being a minority in parliament with a majority opposition party. This was new to Guyana. It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be something we just woke up one morning and, and um, found out how to deal with. He was giving, he thought, as he said, on many occasions, he would give the space for us to navigate through this new Guyana that the people of Guyana had said they wanted. And so he prorogued the parliament, which in effect suspended uh, the parliament. He did not kill it. He did not end the life of the parliament. He provided a space and very clearly said that that is what he was doing, provide the space for opposition parties to talk about various issues um, to see how we could resolve this new circumstance we'd found ourselves in um, with a view to serving the people we had sworn to serve and addressing the issues that are important to them. Uh, and so the President prorogued the National Assembly on the 10th of November and then wrote to the leader, the um, leader of the opposition, Mr. Granger, and invited him to talk. And then um, on the 1st of December, I believe, the leader wrote, of the opposition wrote back to say that we weren't interested in talks and dialogue. 
Um, and so this is where we're, we are right now. Minister Ben. Well, I think that the effect of prorogation, the suspension, as it were, of the National Assembly allowed for space for a retreat from positions which were developing in the Parliament, which were not helpful for the country. The 10th Parliament, um, I've used the term before, um, has become virtually a circus has become not only a laughing stock, but a laughing stock in Guyana, but laughing stock regionally and in other places. And the fact of the matter is that we were not really advancing the country's is interests, the business of the National Assembly, and really working to continue the development of our country. So the prorogation in itself allowed for the opportunity for dialogue, for stepping back from precipitous uh, positions. One of the most precipitous positions which was being taken in the Parliament was that there would have been a no-confidence motion. In one line, no-confidence motion didn't have any whereas and because and why and therefore and wherefore. A one line no-confidence motion which said we would have no confidence in the continued work of the government, of the PPPC in government. And only two members of parliament from the opposition side would have been allowed to speak. So amazingly, majority or minority or not, the government, the ministers of the government, would not have had the ability, the opportunity to defend the record, their record in, as ministers and the record of the government. And uh, I don't think in any situation that could have been allowed for. So the prorogation too, I would say, allowed for the opportunity to catch everyone's attention. You somehow get the feeling that with all the talk and the um, salvos perhaps fired from each side in the media these days, both in the print media and on the airwaves and the internet in cyberspace, that people are not really listening anymore and that there isn't an understanding of the fundamental risks we face. The fact that the country could slide into a crisis as a result of shenanigans in the parliament, as a result of what in some areas in the parliament would only be a naked grab for political power, irrespective of what it means to the livelihood and well-being of the country and its people. So, prorogation, I think, allowed for the grabbing of anyone, everyone's attention. Um, it is unfortunate, I think, that the opportunity would not have been taken by the APNU um, in respect of um, dialoguing. Their suggestion that the president um, was wrongfully somehow making use of, of the constitutional um, results that he had. Um, to take this step is not, um, we really can't take on board. I think it was the wisest course of action. It shows that we have acted out of a lot of forbearance and reticence with respect to what needs to do, to be done to um, protect the development we have and the continued sustaining of our national interests, of our economy, of the well-being of our people and of our country. But and let's just back up one, because Minister Ben was speaking of uh, this one line that they said they were going to just declare no confidence in the government. It was a naked grab for power, um, a, a really a rejection of what the people of Guyana said they wanted. Look, we went to the polls in 20, 2011, and we said to the people of Guyana, we said it, the opposition said, AFC, PNU, everybody said, we want your vote, we want to be your government. And the people of Ghana said, we want the People's Progressive Party to make up the president and the cabinet, but we don't want them in majority in the National Assembly. We want APNU and the AFC to have 26 and 7 seats, and we will give them this one-seated majority. That's what the people of Ghana said. Now, they are not happy with that. 
They want to turn around what the people said and get into office through the back door. Let's take, uh, let's look at why they were bringing this, no, or, or their explanation as to why they were bringing no confidence motion. In my view, they wanted to get into office without having to face people. That's really what they wanted. They don't like the people's decision. That's how democracy works. People get to vote. They don't like that, and so they were going to try to turn it on its head, which they're allowed to do constitutionally, but one would expect them to use that provision, that article in the Constitution, prudently. Now, let's take a look at why they were bringing this no-confidence motion, because the People's Progressive Party, Civic, through its Minister of Finance, went to the National Assembly in, in March and laid a budget that had, uh, as usual, uh, in keeping with the PPP's record and commitment to service, um, had in this budget many things that were going to bring relief to people, that were going to help people, that were going to help families. And um, they slashed the budget. So they slashed things out like um, uh, the, the, the Amerindian Development Fund so that we can't build airstrips yeah, and we can't... The interior, um, the interior airstrips. Now, these airstrips are extremely important because in those far-flung places, the, an airstrip could be the difference between um, life and death. A mother who needs to be evacuated, an airplane cannot land. Um, a sick person who needs to come out, an airplane cannot land. Uh, goods need to go in so that these people can eat. Our Guyanese people can eat. An airplane can't land. That's, that's the reality for the people in the hinterland. The slashed out of the budget was the money that was going to be able to do the Because We Care $10,000 um, grant, which, you have, which is just going to end tomorrow, and you know how much of uh, of an assistance that is to parents, the people across Guyana have said, thank you, this really came in very, very handy. And so the government was not going to allow the opposition to do this reckless, selfish thing and slash it out of the budget, relying on the court's decision that the minister is allowed to restore those monies. That is what uh, Ashley Singh, the Minister of Finance, Dr. Singh, did. And that is their reason for bringing no confidence motion. So essentially, the opposition, because the government was restoring money that could help people, based on a decision that the court had given, and something that the government had done twice before that the opposition had supported, all of a sudden used that as an excuse to bring a no confidence motion. But we have just exposed, and it has been exposed before, that what they really want is, a, is power. So that is how we came to the stage where we're at a no confident, where we were at a no confidence motion. But Minister, we are 24 days, um, almost 24 days since the president would have broke Parliament. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, the views of many Guyanese, you can hear the, the, the level of frustration in them, because they, they are not seeing any movement with um, the whole dialogue and the way forward for Guyana. It is, it is the impression of many that the prorogation would have failed to achieve its, achieve its objective of dialogue, crafting a way forward. Why? Why has it failed? I mean, this is, was an opportunity, a golden opportunity for all parties to sit down and chart a way forward in the interest of the people of Guyana. Well, you know, um, I hear you use the word failure. I wouldn't, um, in, in terms of the stated objectives thus far, and as um, identified in the letter from the leader of the opposition, Mr. David Granger, in rejecting or rebuffing the president's um, call and invite for dialogue, one could say that it is failed in terms of the stated objectives thus far. But the rejection in itself of the opportunity for dialogue in a time when there should be a dispassionate, non-emotive reflection and review of the country's situation and of the workings of the National Assembly and the Parliament as it were, indicates clearly for everyone now, and this is why I say it catches everybody's attention, indicates clearly that there's no real interest in having a working, properly functioning democracy out of the Parliament, but to create as much trouble, as much upset, as much destabilization as one would be able to from the sides of the opposition parties to bring down the government. And I say um, this attempt 
this working in a negative way to come to power will be rude if it does ever happen by people um, on all sides and many people will be sorry. Guyana for the last two decades under the PPP civic administrations has brought itself out from the depths, the depths of the morass of um, being a failed state, of being a failed state. Over all of these years, we have gradually moved the country from where we were using 94, 93% of all the monies brought in by the government for debt servicing. It is now 30 or 40 percent. I don't remember the exact number at the moment. And we have been able to put the monies from revenue into development projects, into the progress in education, into the progress in infrastructure projects, in the projects for housing development, in improved health for our people, in extending the life expectancy of all our people, in having a better life for each Guyanese person even now and the hopes and the certain reality for a better life for our children for the next generation than we ourselves would have had. We have now I think the seventh or eighth year of continued growth in the country's economy. Guyana is one of only two I think countries in the region in the CARICOM region which has a positive growth rate six seven percent if we only count what we can count, what we see. It's certainly more if we look at the development in the landscape in our cities, all over the country, in every town, village, hamlet, where our people live, life is improving, the landscape is being changed, new buildings are going up, people are improving their lives every day. Every day. So we have had a period of eight years of sustained improvements in our economy, in livelihood and well-being. And whatever these machinations, what are these efforts in respect of destabilizing the PPP civic, they could hate us anyway. But our record is clear. These efforts will only redound to resulting in a destruction of continued growth in our economy and a destabilization of the well-being and livelihood of our people. And this is what we're concerned about. This is why when we're in a parliament where we've been pounding and saying, this is why we need to do the national imperative project, whether it's the airport expansion project, whether it's the Milo Falls Road project. I could talk about the Milo for a bit. We said we are now at 97% completion in respect of the Milo Falls Road project. Um, they withdrew support with respect to that project. They were criticisms. Um, We've almost completed the road. Practical completion is there. You know, everyone knows, that one of the biggest issues in the homes of Guyanese is the cost of electricity, the light bill. We know that if we get a mile coming in at 160 megawatts of renewable power, the water which goes over to the waste of our waterfalls every day, the light bill that people have to pay and we accuse or we know and we complain that people steal power in some of the poorer communities or among people who are not. Uh, people have to take the resort sometimes. They can't make up the light bill. We know that the cost of, of the light bill will drop by almost a half. And we know that the savings in not having to import oil to do generation in Kingston or in any part of the country, that we could now take that money and put it, plow it back into the continued development of our country, a transformative um, effort and project for a country. There's no support for it from their side right now, after having initially supported it. Same thing with the airport expansion project. So a destabilization, the destabilization program, as it were, De facto, perhaps some would want to say in the parliament as a result of the efforts of the opposition parties in parliament, that has resulted, will stand in ignominy. The work of the 10th parliament will stand in ignominy in the history of Guyana, even during this new period. I, um, you know, you said the failure of prorogation, and let's. Uh, the president prorogued the national, the parliament, so that we could talk. 
the two part, the three parties, the parliamentary parties could dialogue on what would be the best way forward for Ghana, reach agreement, maybe not reach agreement, but find a way, a common way that we would work in the interest of the people of this country. And so as far as that goes, Granger's letter of the 10th, of the 1st of December that says we're not interested in dialogue. Um, the goal of the prorogation, I suppose, was not met. But I wouldn't say prorogation failed. In many respects, I think we have grown. The country saw that uh, we can prorogue the National Assembly. There was a serious call, invitation by the President and the People's Progressive Party and the Civic for dialogue. The country got exposed to what the opposition is really about and, in, and while it is really sad because for me as a citizen I would have liked to see the mature statesmen and politicians and people who have sworn on religious books saying they will do what's in the best interest of Guyana and her people. I would have liked to see them um, honor those promises and those um, oaths that they took. But we got to see from this period the, the, the letter that was written by David Granger and the rejection of dialogue, um, the rejection of the president's offer to be mature and work in the best interest of the people. That exposed the opposition for what it really is, a set of people. Um, who a narrow set of people who have no interest in Guyana and her development, who have no interest in the single mother and the farmer, in the businessman, in the school child, um, and in them doing better. And all they want is power. And so in some ways, the fact that the goal for prorogation was not met is successful in showing us as a people um, what the political parties are made up of. Here's the PPP who is willing to do anything to put Guyana first, to advance the cause of Guyana and Guyanese growing and progressing. And here's a destructive opposition that is rebuffing and rejecting every such offer, only with a view to destabilizing, to destroying, to pulling Guyana down. If we were to slip back into a place where uh, our growth rate was reversed and our debts were um, increased and get back to a place we were in where we had six to something percent of our people living in poverty, then uh, sadly the opposition seems to be the kind of people who would celebrate that because then that means that they have a softer, a more receptive audience um, to, who, to who they can criticize the government. That cannot be responsible leadership. In your quest for power, nation and the people who would suffer from um, your careless decisions must come first. So the development of the nation must eclipse this, this uh, desire, this selfish desire to be elevated to office. And so for me, prorogation was successful in that regard and that it exposed the nation to what the parties have to offer and which party really will put Guyana first. While, Minister, though, while, while um, it may have achieved that objective, I think, I think any Guyanese will, will hope for there to be a functioning uh, parliament which is working in the interest of, of the people of the country. Of course, the 10th parliament was one, and even before the recess, there were a number, like I mentioned earlier, a number of critical pieces of legislation, that, um, including the anti-money laundering, amendment which is critical to the day-to-day -day life of many, many Guyanese who depend either on um, monies from overseas, businesses and so forth. The missed opportunities during the 10th Parliament which is directly or will directly impact Guyanese. Could we talk a little about some of those opportunities that you've missed? Right. So I could tell you one that we really missed. Um, for the first time in independent Guyana, we have a an education bill that we, we would have proudly um, been giving birth to in the 10th Parliament, a bill that addresses the rights of children and the rights of parents and how we're going to um, reconcile the, the constitutional right to um, open and manage and attend the private school versus the public school um, scenario. We had all these opportunities, things that really need to be addressed in modern Guyana that was before the National Assembly in this 10th Parliament, that in the form of the Education Bill. And I was really looking forward to us crafting together, both government and opposition, 
Um, the way forward for education, I didn't expect that we would agree with every provision in there, but I knew that we would be able to um, find the best uh, environment created by this act through the select committee. That is gone through the window with, with, the, um, with the opposition's refusal to address the urgent issues. And then we have uh, the telecommunications the bill. bill. The telecommunications bill, uh, critically, as we all know, uh, we have a new situation where, um, in terms of communications, we have to take advantage of the advances in technology with respect to the internet, um, the speed at which transactions and uh, things are taking place in that area being able to access the resources in Tanita, not only for education, but also for business commerce and for other efforts. But the telecommunications bill, which we started looking at in select committee, and which I'd say, while there has been progress in the documentation, uh, moving through the various clauses, there are issues in relation to what the powers of the executive, say the minister would have in a new telecommunications sector, in a liberalized reform sector. But critically, the issue with the telecommunications bill redounds uh, or has to do with the questions in a liberalized um, sector with a level playing field, getting away with what is virtually a monopoly still in many areas with respect to the provision of telephone services, whether it's by the cell phone or by landlines. Um, better oversight and management of the sector, and also making sure that we garner enough revenue resources with respect to the operations in the sector. Um, so the fact is, with all of these issues in the 10th Parliament, we were missing our timelines or our schedules in, 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 in relation to bringing these to the people and to bringing these to, 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 to finally to law. And really, the 10th Parliament has not been working. The Parliament has not been working um, in the interest of the uh, people. The prorogation, the suspension gave an opportunity for a reflection, for some introspection with respect to what we individually, for all the members of Parliament, have sworn uh, to do in the Parliament with respect to our countries and people's development. And, um, it has been fundamentally a failure. The parliament in itself is the combination of the National Assembly and the president. And the president has his results in the constitution with respect to how the parliament in total, the National Assembly, the assent of bills and so on works. Our position is that it is in good hands in respect of our president, Donald Ramatar. We think that he has made the right decisions on advice and on fairly torrid discussions sometimes as to what would be the best of course of action to uh, move this parliament away from life support, to re-energize it, to have us take our responsibilities seriously in the parliament. And um, the prorogation, one way or the other in terms of its result as we see coming, would have been the best course of action. Um, it exposes all the interests. It exposes the naked interests on one side and the interests of developing and sustaining our country on the other side. You know, in addition to all the legislation and the bills and the things, the consequences, the good things that would have come out of passing those bills, I think another really missed opportunity was crafting a way for New Guyana. Here is the first time in the history of our country where the people of Guyana has um, configured the parliament differently um, from, from ever before, where they said, we want this party in government, but in, in, in executive office, but we want this party in the majority in parliament. And people were essentially saying to us, Good, look, find a way, find a way to work for us. And we missed an opportunity. We missed a big opportunity to um, behave responsibly and maturely and um, putting Guyana first with nation and the nation, um, the nation's interest coming first. We missed that opportunity by um, having our eyes on one prize alone. 
uh, the opposition just has their eyes on the prize of presidential seat and, and political power in the cabinet. And so they missed the opportunity that was presented in the National Assembly prior to the prorogation and certainly after the prorogation to chart this new this this course for this new Guyana, the new circumstanced Guyana where we now have people saying to us, I want you both working together. And um, that's a big opportunity we missed because no country, Eddie, certainly not our little Guyana, but no country in the world could sustain growth and development and betterment for its people by going back to an elections. Elections don't solve problems. Um, elections are so that people could, de the people could decide who they want in office, but elections are not going to solve every problem. And we essentially have a problem. How do we deal with this new configured, this new configuration that the people of Ghana have given to us in the National Assembly, in Parliament? How do we find a way to work for the people of Ghana? We missed that opportunity because by saying we're not going to have dialogue um, and uh, prorogation effectively, the goal of prorogation effectively being uh, stamped on. What is going to happen is that uh, we now have, we're not in a place where we can talk and negotiate and dialogue anymore. And so we miss the opportunity to, to together craft this new way for a new Guyana with young people who made a decision and older people who made a decision that they wanted to see this from us. And that for me is perhaps the biggest missed opportunity, the biggest lost opportunity um, that will happen because if we have to go back to an election every year, supposing we come back next year and um, we get the same results, we don't expect that we will. The PPP Civic does not expect that we will see the same results because uh, we are going to, um, we, we believe having gone all across this country in open public meetings and at private bottom house meetings that people are fed up and they've uh, now wisened up to what the opposition joint as well as individual um, political parties in the opposition are and what they want. And we believe we're going to see different results in another election, but supposing we don't, are we? and we see the same kind of configuration, supposing people say to us, look, you leaders there, we gave you a chance to go work together and you didn't do it for us. We give you another chance, go back in there and work together. We can't come back every time we have a little problem, every time we have a disagreement, every time we don't agree on a specific clause in a bill. Um, we cannot come back every year for an election or else the country is going to break up. Our growth will be stymied, progress will be stymied. And once that happens, it, individual lives will be affected. We're not going to be able to sustain all the good things we've had, the good common entrance results, the good CXE results, um, our children excelling, our health system um, growing, even as we know we can do better. So for me, that was the biggest missed opportunity. The, the opportunity for the leaders of this country, the people who have held themselves out to be leaders, to really stand up and lead with Guyana at um, with the best interest of Guyana being paramount in everything. That was the missed opportunity for me, and it's really, really sad. Certainly when you, when you talk to the, the average man on the ground, um, that is the first thing that comes to mind and you hear from them. You know, this was an opportunity for us to see something for us, where the political parties in the Parliament can work together. Average man on the ground wants to see um, their children do well in school. They want to be able to provide for their children. They want to be able to um, access transportation and, and, and go across the country. They want to be able to uh, communicate better. They want their drains clean and roads uh, in a way that, that would allow them to uh, traverse comfortably. They want lights in their house and on their streets. They want water in their taps. That's what the average person wants. But, uh, I mean, it ha we, the 10th Parliament, uh, the, the life of the 10th Parliament so far, we've, we've had a difficult course as a country with regards to political agreements or agreements at the level of Parliament. Um, and the President created the opportunity by proroguing Parliament to say, let's talk, let's talk about this. Uh, what went wrong um, in terms of not having that kind of dialogue? Are you of the view maybe the political opposition is not prepared to rise to that kind of occasion? The, the, we have two issues, I think, in respect of that. The, the overall leadership deficit in the parliament, I'd say principally on the side of the opposition, the question of give and take, the question of um, 
making a deal of standing down from positions um, which um, you take hold of and which may seem irrational in the circumstances. Some of it may result from the fact that you have a fairly assortive smaller party in the parliament, the AFC, um, who I've said before somehow is um, leading the APNU by its nose, upstaging the APNU um, in terms of going out there with proposals which are upsetting but dramatic in their effect um, in terms of discussions and, 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 and what is put out in the parliament and in the public. Uh, so I think there is some degree of one-upmanship, one, um, uh, one uh, a situation where each one is trying to get ahead of each other. And so maybe a more dispassionate look, a more dispassionate approach in terms of leadership um, on the side of the main opposition party is not being taken because they have to appear to be as aggressive or assertive or leading more than the other one. So they have competition on their side somehow, which isn't um, doing good in the parliament. They each have to look good or more bad than the other one, you know. The amazing thing at this time in our country's history is that much of the growth and development that is going forward is going forward at this time with continued support from our development partners. Our development partners in the IDB, the European Union, the Caribbean Development Bank, we've just signed a new 44 million uh, US dollar loan agreement uh, for the uh, doing of the West Coast Road. Um, and we have um, monies put together, much of it of national funds in respect of the um, canal number one, number two, the West Bank Road, and the um, Everdeer East Bank Barbies Road. Much of the monies that we are getting and that we are garnering is coming about as a result of the efforts of Guyanese, the hundreds of thousands of ounces of gold that Guyanese are buying, the bauxite that there is, the hundreds of thousands of tons of rice that Guyanese farmers produce, the sugar, even it with its difficulties that we produce, the timber that we produce, even with some of the efforts and the revenue we gain from foreign companies. Much of the energy and drive in the economy comes from government inputs uh, at the level of the central government, which is still the largest employer in all the sectors, but also by the efforts, the strength, the energy, the efforts, the enterprise of individual Guyanese persons and businesses. We have never really seen this at this level in our country, and that is what is transforming our country. And that those are the people who are pushing the growth, having been facilitated by the government. So any reversal of this situation, any reversal of this situation, any undermining of this situation will suffer the people, will suffer poor people, will suffer businesses, will we lead to a regression in our situation. And it will indeed be a great tragedy, a great tragedy, both politically and at the strategic policy and development level, it will be a great tragedy. Master, on the issue in terms of, of um, the president, in the past, the opposition would have um, accused the government of not wanting to, to, to dialogue. On a number of issues. That's not this true. Is an opportunity. Let me just say this: this thing, and, and maybe we haven't spoken enough about it, because you you know you're so busy doing what what we swore to do, uh, serve people, and maybe it's sexy to have people run around thinking that we don't get along. That is not true. You have in a large number of pieces of legislation that went to select committee. Let's take uh, specific examples. We passed about eight, eight or nine pieces of legislation in the Ninth Parliament to deal with women and children, um, the Sex Offenses Act, the, the Adoption of Children, Protection of Children, Child Care and Protection Agency, Child Care and Development Services, Status of Children, big pieces of legislation that we, we had to go into a room and sit down there behind cameras, and maybe the cameras should be let in there behind cameras and trash those legislation out. And we didn't agree with everything. We didn't agree on everything. We didn't go in there um, 
as government and the other side as opposition, we went in there understanding that we want to serve the women of Guyana, particularly, although men and boys get raped, as you know, uh, from recent reports and so on. But we want to go in there and serve the people who are victims of rape or who are likely to be victims of rape. And so we will find a way in these pieces of legislation, in the, let's say the sex offenses legislation, that um, will best serve Guyana. So dialogue has worked. All across this world, you've had wars and you've had sit-outs and you've had um, now these kinds of prorogation and so on. You still have to go back to dialogue. Because, in, you know, since we crawl out of a cave as humankind and we're living in civilization, that's how civilized people function. You will have to have dialogue. There's going to have to be some give and take, some negotiation, some compromise, some, um, uh, you, you know, putting your, your head together and getting the best. And um, so we can't really function without. We'll have this, this unfortunate position of being in a place where um, you just have people who are unwilling um, to dialogue, which would stymie growth. And I suspect the people of Ghana are going to reject that if it keeps happening. But your question was, how is this going to um, affect our development? How How would dialogue or not dialoguing or whether we can actually dialogue and make it work. I'm saying we can. We have done it before. We have continuously done it before. What what the opposition saw here was a narrow window for power and they grabbed for it. Forget Guyana, forget all these fancy things ropes and been talking about about how you know if if the if, if things plummet people will suffer. Forget all that. We want power. We want that seat up there. We don't really care who we trample on to get it, including the people who voted for us and put us there. So that's essentially what's happening. But dialogue can work. It has worked all over the world. Um, Guyana, like the rest of the world, we, don't, we no longer live in a cave. We're living in a civilization. And that is the way that um, we would have to function as a mature, grown country. But, but the, issue, the, issue, the issue here, though, uh, Minister, having said all of this, um, having recognized all of this, the president created the opportunity uh, by way of prorogation of the, the, the parliament. But the question remains, what has prevented the opposition? Is it a matter of not being able to rise to the occasion? Is it a matter of not wanting, just not wanting to dialogue? What, what really could be the reason of, of, of rejecting something well, I, which I, seems to be creating an opportunity I, for I the people? I just talked about the leadership deficit and the opposition benefits or generally say on the side of the APNU, which I think somehow knows better, um, but also maybe the one-upmanship that they have going between themselves and the AFC. Uh, we've seen it when we had the problem in Linden where um, Mr. Granger agreed to certain courses of action with respect to the problems up there, but then you had um, them being one up by the AFC when uh, the AFC went up there. And you know what happened as a result going on along the line. So there's some competition going on there to get the best space, the best attention in the media. And I'd say both the print media and, 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 and the, the visual media have not been, um, well, much of it, they, they have not been supportive in analy analyzing the difficulty that there is um, properly in terms of how the developments have unfolded. But there is a, 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 a struggle on their side, I believe, um, to see who would be the most attractive. Maybe they have, they have a sense that there's some weakness in terms of the leadership on the APNU side. And the AAP, APNU probably feels that the AFC is too small and an upstart and perhaps very bombastic but they are both on the opposition benches, and uh, in any event, they see the, the, the PPP as the one they have to bring down. And um, so it, I don't think it's carefully considered in terms of if there is a change, for better or worse, however you do it, what the results would be, what impact it would have on the country, whether you would be able to um, rule over the ruins, as it were. Um, in the 70s particularly and going into the 80s, 
Diana somehow managed to change a buoyant economy from the 60s, the early 60s, um, into the worst performing economy in the region and in Latin America, in the Western Hemisphere. The PPP civic and government changed all of that. Whatever they think of us, we brought our country from being a failed state to a democratically functioning state with challenges and struggles, of course, but over all these years, if one takes a careful look at the growth and development and the position we are in at now, it is in fact really unparalleled given the challenges we face, the struggles, the, the um, banditry, the terrorism, the, the lawlessness in certain sections. In spite of all of these things, the growth has been positive, there has been progress over all of our country. Even in the remotest areas of our countries, in our Amerindian communities and in interior communities, there has been growth. That all of that can be, can be reversed by this naked rabbit grass for power, without due consideration as to what the results would be in respect of people. Minister, we are quickly, we are almost out of time. I'm going to give you this opportunity for your closing comments. Your closing comments generally on, on, on the state we are at. I'm, the I'm actually surprised you asked why why they didn't use the opportunity for dialogue. I'm very, very surprised that they didn't. Um, I, I think history will record the opposition, particularly the opposition leaders, as doing something that was rather destructive to uh, good leadership principles and to our country as a whole. So I'm very surprised. I mean, even a, a pretense at having dialogue and then saying, well, it didn't work out, would have put them in better standing, I believe, um, when we review the history of this country. I, we're at a place now where the president had said he has, uh, he's providing this opportunity for uh, the political parties to speak, um, to dialogue, to, to reach agreement, to compromise, to negotiate, all in the interest of Guyana and her people. And the opposition leader has outrightly rejected that um, invitation, that proposal. And so now we're at a place where decisions will have to be made. The president was very clear that his only intention to prorogue would be to provide the space for this dialogue. Uh, that has now been said, it has now been clear, made clear in writing that that is not going to happen. I know that it has been, the president has, the president's office has announced that the president is going to be addressing the nation on Saturday um, coming. And I suspect that that is the place where he's going to have to um, decide and announce to the nation that um, what would be the effects of this refusal to dialogue and what would be the way forward um, regarding the parliament, the 10th parliament. Honorable Minister of Education, Priya Manik Chand, and Honorable Minister of Public Works, Robson Ben, I want to thank you too very much for joining me this evening. And of course, we want to thank you very much at home for being part of this program. Do join us tomorrow evening for another program. Thank you.